Hi everyone. <coughs> welcome, welcome to our our the the 2015 series of the Citrus Research Exchange. Um, or welcome back to many of you. But I also want to um, thank. Where did she duck off to already? Um, Yvette, where are you? Yvette, Yvette, let me give a round of applause to Yvette, who organizes this whole thing. And Kosarov, who's in the back control room back there, who, who makes all the AV possible. Um, they are both wonderful. There's a lot of planning that goes on to make these things, um, make these happen. I'm very, very delighted to, to, to welcome you um, for a couple reasons. Um, one is that um, we have a brand new center here at the... Um, at Citrus, and a new initiative, I should say, and it's the called the People and Robots Initiative. I think many of you have heard about this already, but this is a uh, very exciting new program. We have 75 faculty from four, all four of the campuses represented, and we, are, we have a website now. There's lots of information on there. I encourage you to go in, sign up for our, um, our mailing list. There'll be lots of special events, programs. In fact, we went through, we had a project over the summer to, to tabulate all the research um, papers that from the affiliated faculty so far, and it's, um, it, it was, we, we stopped at over 1,000. This is all in the last year and a half. By the way, as of last night, I think that's, that may have doubled. Um, <laughs> how many of you uh, submitted to the ICRA conference last, uh, by the deadline last night? Okay, all right, a bunch of you. Well, um, that's why you see these big circles under my eyes. Um, <laughs> where we were working on a number of them. Um, I also want to say that the, these exchanges, these special lectures, are going to be available on the website. And um, if you want to get emails, you can join up online, etc. cetera. Um, there, we're also going to be having the Citrus Foundry um, entry competitions, and the deadline is coming up on September 27th. There's information on that if you want to apply for that. And then also on the 13th of October is going to be a major event called Citrus Day. And this is where we're going to be um, inviting in some representatives from um, industry. There's going to be a number of our faculty speaking on panels and discussions. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Gray Davis will be here. A lot of events, so please take a look at that. And that's also open to you, uh, but you have to register in advance. Okay, so this, um, this initiative is, uh, is, is big and growing, and if you have questions about it, I can, I can answer them later. The, um, we're very interested in a lot of topics. One of them is, is the, this new developments in, in deep learning, also in human-robot interaction. Uh, one of our areas is precision irrigation, especially in light of the, um, the drought, which maybe after today won't be such an issue. Um, biologically inspired robots or something that we're very interested in. There's a number of results there. Human assistive robots, and an area that I'm particularly excited about called cloud robotics. And that brings us to our speaker today, because um, James Kuffner is one of the, uh, of the most um, um, uh, significant contributors to the field of robotics. And he's, uh, even though he's a young guy, he's, uh, he's made major contributions. He got his PhD at Stanford, and then um, did uh, work in Japan, the University of Tokyo, on um, walking robots, on humanoid ro walking um, machines, made major advances there. Then uh, working together with Steve Laval, he developed the theory, basically invented the idea of the rapidly exploring random tree. And this was a very important breakthrough in being able to plan motions of systems, especially non-holonomic systems. In, in space and be able to systematically explore the spaces to find paths to from, uh, from an initial point to, to an end point. This has been applied in thousands of papers and uh, research projects around the world. James then went to Carnegie Mellon, uh, where he's a professor there and still has an affiliation with Carnegie. He, is, um, he has supervised a number of um, researchers there and did, he has uh, over 100 papers. Um, but then he was um, attracted to Google and Google, um, he went to work on the, on the driving system, um, the, the autonomous car project, and then branched off and started his own group and has been working in that area um, for a number of years. One of the things that's particularly salient um, is that he coined this term, cloud robotics, in 2010. So five years ago. And what he was seeing was this, and I hopefully he'll, t he'll be talking about this today, but this idea of the huge potential of putting together the resources that Google, after all, is, is an authoritative experts in, is um, the power of the cloud, and bringing that together with the power of robotics. 
And that is really where James had the vision and is now, five years later, has really picked up a huge amount of momentum. There's a lot of area of research there. And we're going to hear this morning, I'm very delighted, about the latest advances in cloud robotics. Please join me in welcoming James Kuffner. Thanks, Ken. Um, it's really an honor to be here at UC Berkeley uh, and to be part of the Citrus uh, speaker series and uh, to learn more about this exciting new initiative for people in robots. Uh, I can see um, a lot of faculty and uh, colleagues. Uh, Ken and I have been collaborating for a while now. I can see Peter just came in. Uh, we're collaborating as well, and I see Stefano as well representing. Um, so I'm very delighted to come and, uh, and, and, and talk about um, some of the things I've been working on, particularly with motion planning, and also um, how uh, cloud-enabled robots might be something um, very exciting for the future. So I'm just going to switch over to my, my slides. Okay, so what I thought I would do is um, start by uh, looking back at sort of some of the developments that have been going on uh, and some of the initial work that attracted me to uh, work on robots and motion planning in particular and then explore um, some of the new possibilities and some of the really exciting things that are happening now. So I'm going to start by um, giving kind of a, a bit of an overview of motion planning for humanoid robots, uh, a field that I've been working on for about 20 years, uh, and then how that ties into uh, and how that may uh, get better when you have um, a connection to the cloud, uh, and then uh, talk about um, new initiatives. So first, um, if we look back at the development of something that was super transformative to our society, um, I like to call out the example of the automobile where in 1885 they had uh, the first gas-powered cars um, and it took about 30 years of development in terms of technology for engines and transmissions and steering um, and braking and such uh, in order to have um, an automobile that was both widely affordable and um, uh, accessible and that of course caused a huge transformation in society. The computer is another uh, huge technology transformation. Um, there were lots of expensive prototypes, they mostly existed in universities um, or research centers or national labs uh, and then a period of about 30 years of rapid advancement in transistors and storage and displays uh, led to finally uh, an affordable personal computer and that of course transformed the world. Uh, many of us uh, in the room uh, have experienced another transformation um, and it, it's still going on but um, I would argue that um, the, the smartphone has been probably the, the largest uh, technology transformation in the last uh, at least uh, since 2000, I would say, um, in terms of you know, changing the way people interact. And, uh, and you can see how it, it took uh, quite a while until we got there and they were affordable and, and, and had all the functions that we needed. Um, I actually like to argue that um, in some sense, uh, robots have been around in factories, but they haven't been really helping us in, in homes or offices and people have been working hard on this um, and some of the challenges obviously are how do you deal with um, uncertainty and safety and privacy and all of these issues. Um, but the technology is, is, is really advancing and I, I think it's quite exciting. Um, and uh, it's always dangerous to make a prediction about when things are going to be ubiquitous and affordable but uh, you know I'll put it out there anyway. Uh, maybe sometime in the next 15 years, hopefully uh, in my lifetime, we'll start to see uh, a lot more useful and capable robots. And uh, you know, the, the robotics effort here at Berkeley is, is also helping make that happen with the, the, the learning and, and planning. So um, I like to talk about uh, advances in AI um, by examining what computers are good at, which is right now they're very good at uh, managing and storing and accessing lots of data and also doing billions of arithmetic calculations per second. Um, and if you look at um, Deep Blue, 
beating Kerry, Gary Kasparov uh, in 1997, the first time the computer defeated the world chess champion. Um, that program analyzed 200 million chess boards per second. Um, that is not the way that humans play, but it certainly is effective. Um, and so I got really interested in this area of planning, something that uh, computers could do exhaustively searching various possibilities very quickly and coming up with strategies. Um, and uh, I like to say planning is reasoning about the consequences of, of future actions. And uh, those of you robotics would recognize that equation, x dot equals f of x u, as sort of the core of, of a control system. So what are some of the challenges for planning in the real world? Uh, I think the, the biggest problem is, of course, that uh, a lot of planning requires a, a good model of, of what you're trying to accomplish both the task and uh, your capabilities. And oftentimes, those prior models have uncertainty. Uh, you also are using sensors to monitor the state of the robot and the state of the world. And that also is subject to errors and noise and uncertainty. Uh, and then you're giving motor commands to servos. And those, unfortunately, also are subject to some noise uh, in, in your control signals. Um, and then, uh, if you think about uh, just this task of a humanoid robot lifting a box, um, how large is a search space that you would have to plan under in order to move a box, let's say, from one location to another while avoiding obstacles and keeping the robot balanced and not colliding with anything um, and reaching the goal location? So this is a, a very high-dimensional uh, search problem. And, uh, and then, to top it off, um, you actually have the laws of physics, so uh, the world won't wait for you um, if you make a bad move, uh, and particularly in a, in a, in a robot that balances, um, you have to actually compute that control signal before the robot falls down. Uh, so I've been working on various uh, robots um, at, uh, when I was at Stanford and then um, went to Carnegie Mellon. And uh, we like to claim Ken as one of our alumni, by the way. Um, and, uh, and then with my colleagues in Japan, uh, trying to understand uh, what we could do. So some of the work that we did was looking at autonomous grasping and manipulation. And so um, if uh, I apologize for all the roboticists uh, who, who uh, already are familiar with this, but for those who are not, um, the concept of config configuration space is, is quite useful here. So imagine this robot uh, made of three rotational links. So I've got a side view here, um, and this is a top view of the robot, and this is a side view showing sort of, sort of three rotation angles. And I could move this arm um, in, uh, in space and grab things in, in a plane. Um, if, I, if I imagine the free space, um, represented by the joint angles, um, I could imagine that, OK, it, it, this might be able to wrap around. Um, and um, I could map various configurations of the arm, uh, whether or not they're free or colliding with an obstacle. So what I've done here is I've put this, this red pole here um, as an obstacle in the workspace. And I, what I want to know is, well, what regions of the joint space and or the configuration space now become inaccessible because I've just placed this obstacle here. So this is the mental exercise. Try in your mind to see if you can imagine um, what areas of this joint space are going to be for, forbidden. And <laughs> it turns out um, that it's a little more complicated than a lot of people realize. Um, and uh, because it has a lot of very convex uh, geometry in the, jo in the joint space, uh, planning uh, a free motion, so a motion that goes from one free configuration to another free configuration, has to actually avoid this C space obstacle. And, uh, and that's actually the challenge of motion planning, is can we build an algorithm that, in the joint space, can produce a free trajectory that will avoid uh, C space obstacles and, then, and therefore avoid hitting things in the world? Um, and uh, that, of course, uh, led to uh, some of the work that I did with my colleague Steve Laval on trying to come up with an efficient algorithm for doing that. And what we tried to do was build something that um, would scale so that it would, uh, it would, would actually work in any dimension, um, but it wouldn't exhaustively search the space. It would try to uh, proactively, in, in some sense, have a greedy bias so that it would 
quickly converge towards a goal, but at the same time it wouldn't get stuck in some local minia, minima like, like a, a true greedy search would. And so the way that it works is um, you uh, initialize your search uh, by growing a tree both from the start configuration and the goal configuration and uh, iteratively, extending, oops, iteratively extending the tree uh, by essentially sampling from the free space and then attempting to connect uh, whenever you uh, connect a new branch on the tree that you're growing, you attempt to connect um, that new node with uh, a branch from the other tree. And then once you've joined the trees, then you will you actually get a path that is in free space that leads from the start to the goal. So um, it looks something like this if you animate the algorithm. Um, and uh, it explores the space and uh, uh, tries not to get trapped in local minima. Um, that was used, um, this is a, a six-dimensional space, both translation and rotation, and the goal here is to remove these two rings of this alpha puzzle. And uh, this was one of the first times that a computer was able to actually solve um, for the motion needed to, to remove this, uh, this problem. And so uh, it turns out that I could also just say, I have seven motors here um, on my, my robot arm, and I can say I, I, I want to grasp this bottle, and now it's actually running and building a rapidly exploring random tree in the joint space of the arm, and then is able to compute a free motion to, to grasp the object. And then once it's grabbed it, it actually plans another path. Um, and it, at that time, it only took a few seconds to compute that path in the seven-dimensional joint space of the arm. And then you could actually have a very expensive beverage delivery service. Um, um, so one of the things we also looked at was um, how can we um, utilize the fact that you've got two arms and, and do automatic regrasping. Um, and some of my former students uh, who uh, worked on this um, started by basically building um, a, a model of what you wanted to grab and then a model of the hand and then attempting to find stable grasps because there's many choices um, involved. Let's say if I wanted to grab this bottle, um, I could grab it from the top or the side, uh, and humans do this effortlessly, uh, but robots actually are quite puzzled, and, uh, and they're not very good at it. Uh, and so one of the um, exciting research collaborations I have with uh, Peter and Ken is in this area um, to try and see how we can make robots better at grasping, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so this kind of led to this um, effort that we had at Carnegie Mellon as part of the Quality of Life Technology Center, which was trying to build um, planning technology and autonomy for a, a robot that could pick up cups, maybe load a dishwasher, uh, maybe fetch something from the fridge. Uh, and uh, we built um, a, uh, a system that um, at the time um, would recognize features that we had trained um, on various items in a kitchen and then um, it was able to recycle those uh, unused items. Uh, and, it, and it used uh, fairly standard um, feature detectors to um, recognize those objects and then associate them with a model. So it had a little database. It would look up um, a model of each of these objects and then um, use that in order to uh, identify and compute grasps and then compute a, uh, a plan that would avoid hitting the other objects in the scene uh, while trying to pick up that object. Um, and uh, my student, Dimitri, uh, who, who um, also was a postdoc here at Berkeley, um, worked on trying to understand, well, you not just have geometry um, that is affecting the motion, but also you have constraints that are derived from the weight of the object. Um, or, um, or uh, uh, sliding constraints. And so uh, it turns out that um, you can adapt the exploration techniques that we built um, in order to take into account these constraints uh, and project those into the space. And so um, I think um, in the last 10 years, the, the number of constrained tasks that, uh, that the robots have been able to do without being manually pre-programmed uh, has increased quite a lot, and that's also quite exciting. So we built, as part of this effort, uh, a lot of different software components, uh, and particularly my, my student, Rawson, 
um, has uh, sort of developed uh, what he calls sort of um, a robot library or dictionary of tasks and planners that would uh, combine um, all of these components together so that uh, a robot would be able to reason about um, a complex manipulation task. And um, uh, what uh, eventually came out of that was um, our contribution to the open source community uh, as part of the OpenRave uh, software. And Rosen actually built a company around this software in Japan and it's actually doing intelligent automation, um, which is a good place to start, uh, I think, uh, as there's a lot of robots that are currently sort of laboriously manually programmed. Some of the, these planning algorithms will allow them to be uh, programmed much more efficiently. But uh, if anybody's interested in, in, in downloading and playing around with some of these planning algorithms, uh, we have contributed to the open source community. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, another instance of uh, the planning effort that we worked on. And uh, in particular, uh, we had this problem where um, you could see in the top corner, uh, imagine if you're given a, a legged robot that wants to navigate in a home or office environment and there happens to be things on the floor that it needs to, um, to avoid. And a wheeled robot, of course, always has to circumvent obstacles by going around them. Uh, but a legged robot could actually step over or step upon uh, things in the way. And so the, the goal was to try and figure out if we could apply a search technique to compute a sequence of footsteps that would actually avoid obstacles um, and, uh, and allow the robot to traverse um, challenging environments. So I had a student, my first PhD student, who um, he's now working uh, at Google with, with part of uh, Boston Dynamics. Uh, but he developed a uh, search technique that poses the planning problem as a classical tree search where you have um, free uh, footstep configurations and also footstep configurations that may be colliding with obstacles. And the goal is to um, sort of sample among the possible discrete placements and then produce um, a, a, a valid sequence. So here's an example of um, a robot that we uh, had used. Um, I'll turn this down. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, the computer vision computes a depth map. This used a, st a stereo technique. Um, of course, this is 15 years ago. We have much better things now and also depth cameras. But then the goal was to essentially extract the flat area of the floor, detect the red ball that the robot was trying to walk towards, and then compute this walking sequence, um, and then execute that on the robot. And so the robot uh, could do this calculation in about three seconds um, by exploring uh, several thousand footstep candidates and then computing a walking sequence and executing it um, in order to uh, kick this ball. Um, and then uh, it turned out just a couple of years later, uh, just by upgrading the, the PCs in the robot, we suddenly got the execution time down to about to less than one second. And since, since the robot could actually replan at every step cycle, we could actually change the world. And so it could actually look down, update its map, and then execute um, a replan um, from every uh, footstep location. So during the time that it's actually executing one of the planned steps, it's actually recomputing um, from its current location to the goal location and doing this fast replanning. So this led to an experiment which we call uh, Osmo and the Pink Blades of Doom. Um, the, uh, the, we, we, we partnered with Honda to essentially um, use their uh, robot. And you can see here, uh, the goal is to actually um, make it to that orange dot on the floor. And it's, it's carefully computing um, valid footsteps in order to avoid stepping on uh, the obstacles. Now it turns out, if you have a good model of the motion of the robot and a model of the motion of the obstacles, you can, you can make it uh, actually plan in both space and time for this footstep sequence. We, we play, this is Osimo plays Frogger. That's what we like to call this. Um, and this is shows an example of, of actually the search happening uh, live. And uh, at this point, we got it down to uh, 800 millisecond cycle for Osimo. So uh, my student, Joel, could essentially um, move the target object around. Um, there was an overhead camera sort of tracking obstacles and also tracking uh, where, where the object was. And, uh, and then you can actually move, um, move obstacles or move things around. You see it tortures the poor robot. Um. <laughs> uh, 
by changing the world. And uh, the goal was to basically make a robot that was adaptive, that didn't have pre-programmed motions, but actually would um, be safe and adapt. Now, you can also track rotational velocities as well as linear velocities. So this would be if your robot wanted to pass through a revolving door, how would you actually plan the motion um, to avoid uh, stepping on obstacles? Um, and then we decided uh, we should make it a little harder. Um, so these were actually tracking and estimating online uh, rotational velocities for these spinning blades. Um, this is actually quite hard for a human to do. Um, I, I, st I stepped on that many times and angered my students. Um, but uh, the goal was to basically um, give the, the robot planning um, a, tr a real challenge that would involve you know, the dynamic constraints of the robot as well as the constraints, uh, the estimate constraints of the moving obstacle. Um, in, uh, in that. So we finished that experiment, and, um, and, and what did we learn? Well, one of the things that was interesting was that we didn't have a good way of estimating where the robot was going to go, because in some sense, it was autonomous. It would decide where it wanted to go. And we thought it might be useful to actually um, have an interface to control your preferences. So this is um, an experiment with augmented reality uh, interfaces, and I'll, I'll explain what's going on in a second. But essentially what Joel did is he just drew on the floor um, a desired path. Now it's very rough, um, and, but the planner uses it as a heuristic. And it's also, so what I'm doing is I'm overlaying on the floor also the result of the, of the recent replan. You can see um, how well the robot executes. Um, it's actually replanning from scratch after every motion. That's why some of the footsteps adjust their location because of noise in the execution. Um, but then you'll see what this looks like from the point of view of the operator. Um, he's wearing an augmented reality display. He could essentially uh, use a little interface. He could point at the robot and say, start walking. Um, and now he can actually see what the robot is planning to do. And if he doesn't like it, he could stop it um, or, or tell him, hey, I don't actually want you to walk there. Um, and uh, this is kind of a nice sort of hybrid approach where um, I, like, I liken it to uh, the semi-autonomy of uh, riding a horse. Um, you give the horse high-level directions, but you don't have to tell the, ro the horse like, how to bend its knee and how to stay balanced. Um, and so I think we need some uh, you know, cooperation here. So here he's actually trying to force the robot to climb over um, the obstacles. And so the robot you know, does its best to stay close to the desired path. Um, and uh, is able to replan um, and uh, execute those kinds of walking motions. So I think it's actually, uh, in some sense, uh, a good synergy between the people and robots initiative here because you really want um, humans to be um, part of, of solving problems and, and, and interacting with the robots, um, even though robots do have some autonomy and have some capabilities, we want them to always be sort of uh, tools for their human users. Okay, um, this led to um, planning dynamic actions uh, with my student, Matt Zucker. Um, this was part of the learning locomotion project that DARPA had funded, and here, um, the idea was that instead of just a single footstep, you could actually imagine like a whole body dynamic motion <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as one uh, primitive. <laughs> so the goal is that you could actually um, you could, you could find uh, these dynamic motions that would, could be part of <laughs> the search process. So the, in, instead of having a footstep planner that only looked at single footsteps, you could actually have these compound footsteps or dynamic actions that you could, as, you could, you could put in as part of the search process. So here it's, we have a library of dynamic actions like lurching forward or, or jumping a barrier. Uh, and then it was able to basically find out what sequence of dynamic motions it needs in order to, to find this. Um, I had a, a, another student who um, was working on what if instead of just circumventing obstacles, the robot could proactively move them out of the way. This, uh, humans do this all the time quite effortlessly when there's a chair in the way or a door in the way. We, we manipulate objects and move them out of the way to create free space. Um, Sadly, uh, Mike Stillman passed away last year, um, but he, he made some really interesting contributions. And I wanted to, to explain a little bit about what he did, did because um, I think it, 
uh, it highlights some of the challenges and some of the exciting new directions that could be possible by combining some of this with deep learning, uh, one of the new major initiatives here at the People and Ro Robots Initiative. Um, so th in summary, Mike's problem was this, like if the robot was trapped and let's say the goal was outside, what we'd really like is um, a way for uh, the robot to proactively move objects out of the way and create free space. And uh, so if you actually go back to the classical configuration space uh, example, uh, what is happening here is you've got an accessible amount of configuration space, but then you've got um, you know, this other free space that's currently inaccessible. And um, the, what Mike uh, did was formulate a planning system that could reason about the connectivity of these spaces and, uh, and reason about how mo motions of obstacles actually led to the merging or creation of, of, of of connected and disconnected spaces. And so um, what ends up happening is you get this free space graph that you can search along on top of the discretized motion space of the robot itself. Uh, and by exploring this graph um, interactively and uh, sort of uh, incrementally, you didn't have to actually build the whole thing from scratch. And so you will end up essentially um, computing motions for obstacles that will al allow to some of these previously inaccessible uh, free spaces to be connected. Um, and uh, it does this essentially by searching the action space. Um, and there's a, a, a dynamics model of pushing and sliding that he built for uh, things that could either roll or slide. Uh, uh, but the, the main point was that um, you, you actually integrate all of this into the search process and you get uh, this hierarchical search. And so, for example, the, the way that it works is it first computes um, a path that passes through all of these obstacles with some weights. So at first it tries to avoid uh, you know, passing through obstacles, obviously, if it can. But if it can't, if there's no free space and there's no path, it first uh, passes through objects that are that, that it estimates are, uh, will, will require the least amount of effort to, to move. Um, so it identifies that table as uh, the next thing that it needs to move in order to uh, make progress. And so um, it ends up computing and searching the action space of, of, of applying forces to the table and torques to the table to actually open up a, a path for itself. And then um, it, it increments and replans um, and then identifies this as the next one. Now, unfortunately, after searching the action space of this uh, sofa, it realizes that it actually can't, um, there are no uh, actions that it can find that can connect those, those free spaces. So it actually backtracks and um, computes, updates the plan to find the next uh, obstacle. Um, and uh, there, it's actually able to make forward progress, uh, make free space for the robot. Uh, and this, um, this process basically continues um, again and what you end up happening, uh, getting is uh, a result like this, which is the final solution um, that took about six seconds to plan. Um, and this was about 10 years ago, um, but uh, what I really like about this is that um, the robot is able to um, proactively and incrementally search, uh, spend compute resources on the parts of the problem that it knows are actually impeding its progress. So um, that means you can, you can add this uh, planner to a result with hundreds and hundreds of moving obstacles, but it'll only focus on the ones that actually matter for solving the task at hand. And uh, this was uh, published uh, about 10 years ago. Here's this, in this example, um, I'll just run this example. Uh, I, one, one part that I really um, like about this one is that so it pushes these obstacles out of the way, and you'll see as he starts to make progress, um, the reason why it, it, it moved that is you can see it actually made free space um, so that it navigated around. Um, so it wasn't just sort of pushing it aside and moving forward, it was actually reasoning about the free space that it was creating by, um, by moving that. And uh, this, is, this kind of planning and introspection, I think, poses a real challenge for, for deep learning. Um, but I think it'd be super exciting if we could generate from some of these planning models a lot of synthetic data that we can then train some of the, the learning models. Um, things that require a lot of like 
uh, backtracking or forward planning, I think, are, are very challenging for a lot of learning systems. And, uh, and, and this could be quite exciting if we figure out a way to, to actually train up the models and, 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 and encode this kind of intelligence. But we still need a model. Um, so yeah, um, I, I like to have my students um, work on building the algorithms and simulation, but at the end of the day, they've got to work on the real robots. And so um, back to the original uh, task at hand, could we actually get the robot to run the planner, reason about the free space, and then actually execute motions to move um, these, these objects out of the way? And so this was, uh, you know, a lot of software here, you know, to um, have a force torque sensor on the wrist so that you detect contact, and then, you know, making sure that he has a good grip, and then understanding online, adapting to um, actually the, the motions of the object that you're manipulating, make sure it's actually going where you want it to go. If it doesn't go where you want it to go, you have to change your plan. Um, but the goal was to actually um, deploy this um, so the big question in everybody's mind uh, is, when are we going to have these intelligent robot personal assistants? And um, I, I feel that uh, it's a super exciting time right now. And one of the things that uh, ha has motivated me is looking at what's happening uh, in the industry. And so um, if we think about what is really hard, we've got these unstructured environments. So robots work well in factories, but what if, what if the environment's unstructured? Um, then um, it leads to this research snowball where, okay, because the environment is unstructured, I need online perception and modeling, and I can't, I can't cheat with a priori models. Um, but that means that I can't use predefined trajectories. I've got to actually compute the motion online. Um, and, and that uh, also means that I may need dynamic tasking because I can't rel rely on predefined sequences. So I may actually need a, another higher level of reasoning about all of this. Um, and so uh, at that point, um, I, uh, I decided to try and see what I could do in the industry. And so I moved to the self-driving car team um, to work on that project uh, early on. And then uh, later on at Google, founded um, a couple of other projects to try and see how we could get uh, some of the in industry infra infrastructure uh, harnessed on these problems. And um, uh, we, we started out with um, essentially this proposal to build a cloud-enabled robot using old smartphones. And the insight was that, you know, we had been spending all of this money buying these expensive m machines that it required uh, GPS and IMUs and cameras and microphones and memory and hard disks and network connections. But if you think about, you know, these smartphones, they're already really cost reduced and most people were turning them over every 18 months. Uh, they were either giving them to their kids to play games or selling them on eBay for five bucks. Um, and, uh, and they already had all the things that you really needed to make a robot. It had like a 3G antenna, a Bluetooth antenna, a camera, a touch screen, a microphone, a speaker, a CPU, memory. So everything uh, was, was already uh, in there. And so we open sourced um, uh, the, the Ross uh, robotic operating system from Willow Garage uh, on a native port on Android so that you could take any Android phone and turn it into a robot um, and, uh, and, uh, and build it. And it got me thinking also about what was enabling more exciting applications with these cloud-enabled robots. And I think one of the big factors has actually been mobile uh, broadband speed. So if we think about um, the growth of CPU power from Moore's Law, that's dwarfed by the 1600x growth in mobile broadband speed. I mean, nobody would have believed that 10 years ago you'd be able to stream HD video to your phone all at the same time. Um, that's really quite remarkable. And so that actually leads to a lot of these interesting benefits of these cloud robots. So we have um, this data that can be hosted in the cloud and organize information about it. Um, we can also offload a lot of these heavy compute tasks, for example, planning um, or learning to the cloud. And uh, what that allows us to do is then create robots that are cheaper and lighter and easier to maintain. It's, it's a, akin to a desktop PC versus a thin client um, that you can use. That means that if you don't have to carry around as much 
uh, compute power or hard disks, you can make the robot lighter, which means that you get a virtuous cycle of, of not needing as much battery, and then the robot becomes even lighter still. Um, and then I am really excited about this idea of um, creating um, knowledge and, and motions and skills and behaviors that we can reuse across robots and then data mine the history of those cloud-enabled robots. Um, so let's think about an example of, of, of some of the APIs that are already um, available that could be useful for a robot. So if you think about uh, the speech API, uh, you can build an app and download uh, Google's speech API and then get translations in, in any language. Um, and uh, that means that it should be obvious that every robot we create should be able to, cr to, to understand and translate in, uh, any of the languages that we have speech models for and to do that in real time. Um, another example is perception. Uh, Google had several projects um, exploring how we could do online perception from a mobile phone. It was called Google Goggles. I don't know how many of you actually ever tried it or used it. Yeah, some of you. Um, and what was interesting about it is you could essentially point your, your phone camera at a landmark or a famous painting and it would just tell you exactly who painted it and when they painted it, uh, which was really quite interesting. Um, we now have a, a new um, app that actually does image-based language translation in real time, which is super useful for travelers. Um, I encourage you to try it out. It's actually quite magical. Um, but the idea was, can we build robot goggles? Can we have a robot that would take a picture of something, upload that image to a service, and then get back semantics and meaning? Um, and in particular, what if it could actually download a 3D model so that it knew how to grasp it? Um, and I'm very excited about the collaboration uh, that we've had for a while um, exploring uses of this. Um, so here at Berkeley, um, Ben Kehoe and, and, and other folks from Ken's lab, uh, we worked on building um, a prototype that would use the goggles recognition engine, but then uh, use a pre-computed table of, of grasps um, with uncertainty models that try to leverage um, the fact that you could host these in the cloud. And um, uh, all of these uh, sleepy roboticists here who submitted to ICRA, um, I thank you for coming, uh, but I wanted to give a quick shout out to the hard work that they did the last couple days building up a new collaboration uh, a paper where we're trying to explore grasping at scale using this dexterity network. Um, I think it's, it's super exciting and the, go the goal is to, to actually have the robot able to leverage um, knowledge about grasping similar objects across um, the many objects in the world that a robot may want to be able to grasp. And so I think this leads to uh, what I like to call robot sourcing. So human crowdsourcing, uh, things like Wikipedia or Google Map Maker, where you try to scale very hard semantics and quality control problems. Um, what if you could have a large deployment of robots that would offer similar advantages? And uh, I, I think Ken put it one way, instead of having to have one robot run for 10,000 hours and, uh, and generate 10,000 examples of a task, what if you had 1,000 robots run for 10 hours? Could you generate the same amount of data? And I think that's super compelling, and, uh, and, and I like that idea. Um, another example would be maps and planning. Um, you know, we have uh, APIs for doing uh, maps uh, you can build on your mobile phone, uh, but a robot should basically have those um, available to it as well. And uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, contributions to um, the open source with Project Tango, if some of you may be familiar with it, which uses a depth camera built into a mobile device so that a robot could actually build a map um, and localize itself in a 3D environment. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this uh, idea of skills, like can we build an app store for robots? That means that if you program your robot to do a task that is useful, maybe it's, uh, I know, uh, uh, Peter's group has been working on, uh, you know, folding laundry or, or uh, pairing socks. Um, if you were able to actually build that app, can you actually upload it and anybody who has a similar robot can actually download the app and then have that capability uh, in their robot? I think that's, that's uh, very compelling. Of course, it uh, uh, reminds me of, of The Matrix. I like to, to uh, sh sh you know, show this example from the movie where Trinity doesn't know how to fly a helicopter, but then she says, you know, I need a helicopter pilot program. It gets downloaded to her brain, and now she can fly a helicopter. I think robots should be able to do that as well. Um, um, so Google Now is uh, something that um, is akin to uh, Siri and other uh, 
assistance. But um, one thing that I would say it's a little bit different is that um, it, it, it does do more than, than answers to just factual queries. Um, but what I really like and I think could be useful for robots is access to the knowledge graph, which is um, uh, the version of Freebase that, that Google's been curating. Um, and uh, we have eight languages now supported, but uh, it has um, 18 billion facts um, as of January 2013. Uh, and the, the goal is that the robot will have all that knowledge. Uh, Amit Singhal, our VP, has always said that he wanted Google to, to be uh, the Star Trek computer. Uh, and that we build a Star Trek computer where you could ask the computer um, f about things in the world and it would give you inf information. I think our robots should be able to do that. So some, some observations uh, in closing. So I think um, I'm really excited about um, this era of big data and, uh, and deep learning. Uh, they're making great advances in object recognition with things like ImageNet. Um, and the question is, are we approaching um, a critical mass in terms of memory and storage and compute resources? Um, in order to mimic uh, the human or animal brain. Um, I also think it's very interesting to see um, the pendulum swing um, between embedded apps and server-based apps. Um, and, uh, and, and in some sense, the cloud resources being used to train these networks, but then you can actually deploy these networks uh, as an embedded system on your device, which is really exciting. Um, and so if we sort of think about numbers, rough numbers compared to biology, um, you could imagine that uh, a human, uh, people estimate, have roughly uh, 100 billion neurons um, with uh, 10 to the 15 synapses. Um, if you have a desktop PC with about uh, 64 gigs of RAM, can you, can you make um, uh, the number of connections similar to, uh, let's say, a mouse? Um, maybe that's, that might be doable. Um, but I think, um, obviously, um, training one of these nets is, is different than actually running one or, or in evaluating one. So that opens up more possibilities. We can use all the compute resources and data that we have to try to train, train a network, uh, but then uh, it can be actually run and deployed um, on, a, on a smaller machine. So I think this is super exciting. Um, I, I'm really eager to see what's going to come out of this People and Robots initiative. You have some of the best machine learning talent and, and roboticists here. Um, I think um, it's, it's ripe time to reconnect some of the AI task planning and the motor control. Um, we have some collaborations that I'm really excited about uh, between Google and UC Berkeley exploring some of this. Uh, learning motor control and visual motor control. Um, I'm also really interested in, in how we can also build a layer of reasoning or use planning algorithms to generate synthetic data to train them. Um, I think cloud robotics enables cheaper, lighter, and smarter robots. Um, we have infrastructure that exists, and um, we can apply these um, for training um, very deep models um, and deploy them. And uh, I really like the idea of a shared knowledge base, that we will have uh, a lot of information about the world that's organized, it's accessible to robots, and then, of course, um, the robots will become better and adaptive because they'll be able to share their experiences. Uh, I have uh, four kids, and each one of my kids has spilled their juice at least 100 times in my home. Um, I would love that if, if you trained a robot how to grasp and not spill something that you could then transfer that skill to all the other robots. And so you only have to deal with one robot that spills a hundred <laughs> times. Um, and uh, I think this is, uh, this is really super exciting. Um, so uh, thank you all for, for coming and listening. And I'm really excited to, to continue to work and collaborate with Citrus and the People and Robots Initiative. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited about what will come out of this new initiative here at, at Berkeley. Uh, and, and the other uh, UC schools. Uh, thank you all, and, uh, and I wanted to give a shout out to all my students and collaborators who did this. James, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'm very curious about the issue of exploration versus constraint satisfaction. So some examples, uh, if we're talking about a robot solving a maze or 
you know, delivering a beverage, then, you know, if a constraint is violated, then you bump into a wall or spill some juice. But if we're talking about robotic surgery or autonomous vehicle, we cannot afford to violate constraints. I was wondering if you could just give me some insights in how to navigate this, this issue. That's a very, very good question. Um, so at, at the, the core, the classical path planning problem is always avoid obstacles. But of course, when you want to manipulate something, you have to contact it. And in fact, doing surgery would be an extreme example where sometimes you might have to like push deformable tissue out of the way in order to actually manipulate the thing you want. So clearly, it, 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 it involves a, a different formulation. But I think um, in some sense, you could actually back up a higher level and say, um, what I have available is a bunch of actions. And some of those actions can involve contact and constraint or manipulation or deformation. And what I'm searching is, of, of all the available actions that I have, how do I select a sequence of actions to solve my goal and to solve my task? So in that sense, you can kind of unify the classical path planning, avoid obstacles, don't bump into things with constraints or with avail you know, constrained actions. Yeah. James, to follow on that idea, I'm curious um, how you, to what degree you see the potential of the cloud for handling um, robustness? Right, where, where there's a lot of uncertainty, as you mentioned, from all those sources. So can the cloud, I mean, a lot of, there's some concern that, that you, you, being able to do this online in real time, there's latency problems, et cetera, but to what degree could you pre-compute or use that to, to address um, the robustness issues? So um, that's a great question. Something I'm super excited about is um, uh, it should be the case that um, with a model, let's say um, I want to, to grasp this object, that if I have a model of friction and friction cones and um, forces uh, that, that uh, envelop the object, and I also have a, a dynamic model of the, of, of the object itself, um, I should be able to, in simulation, uh, predict how well uh, a grasp is and how, how good it is and how stable it is. And so imagine um, I could actually simulate uh, if I have a model of the noise, like my sensor noise and my, my actuation noise, I could actually simulate 10,000 different executions of the same grasp with a noise model um, and then evaluate the overall probability that executing that grasp will succeed given the noise model and the assumptions I have about my expected uncertainty. And therefore, um, uh, it should be that a robot, if you, if you give it a model of a hand, you give it a model of an object, it should be able to automatically compute and score the, the grasps that are the highest probability of, of success. And I think, um, I, I like to call this, uh, instead of uh, robot dreaming, um, I like to call it robot meditation. The, the idea that um, it's, it's not just aimless dreaming, it's actually meditating on a task and you sort of wake up enlightened. So I like this idea of uh, you say, okay, robot, um, you know, here's a new object that I want you to be able to, to grasp reliably. And the robot you know, says, okay, master, understood, looks at it, and then goes to sleep. And then overnight, it like simulates grasping the thing hundreds or millions of times. And then it wakes up enlightened and then is able to execute a successful grasp. Um, I really like this, uh, this, this idea, and uh, I think um, you know, dealing with uncertainty has always been a, a huge problem, and now we can actually try and apply some of these, uh, these resources on it. Um, there's also the competing approach, though, of, of, well, instead, what we should do is, is let's just demonstrate executing the task several times, and you know, Peter's lab has been working on how to extrapolate that across more examples by um, augmenting the, the, the few examples that you have of the real-world executions uh, using a model to give, give much more data to train than a learning system on. So I also, also think that's super exciting. So uh, with this model of grasping, you could meditate on it, uh, but then you could also maybe feed the execution logs of all that meditation into a learning algorithm, and then suddenly you have something that, uh, that's super robust. Um, yeah, I'm very excited about that. Excellent. Well, I think that, that depends on getting enough sleep um, <laughs> for, for humans or robots, which we, uh, we, we, we're a little bit short on. You know, it's interesting because I think your, your, your point is, actually, that's probably very similar to the way humans work, is that in our sleep state or meditative states, that we actually are trying out lots of combinations and sort of pre-computing, in a sense, all these different possibilities so that we're better prepared when the real things happen. Um, 
Yeah, we're very excited about this, James, and we really are. You know, I think you're 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 setting this example of really leading industry into these new areas of research, and I know you played a key role in the um, in Google's collaborations with all these new companies. It's a hugely exciting uh, example for for the whole field, and um, and I think that that and and all the contrib contributions you talked about today uh, really set a terrific example for all of us. So thank you so much, James. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll see you next week, next Wednesday, for the next uh, research exchange. <laughs> cool, cool. Great talk. That was so good. I'd love to get a few of the slides. Oh, absolutely. Like, pictures, like, yeah, this is so great. Uh, you did, that was perfect. Good, good. I'm so glad. I'm glad.